Um, and we talked about the skills people need to, uh, to learn and practice as change makers to help the appropriate diagnosis and sense making, right? And a lot of that is <laughs> knowing how to wield certain frameworks, knowing how to build mm -hmm. community um, around the, the issues that you're trying to address. Um, mm -hmm. But it feels like you're hitting on additional skills um, other than knowing the problem that need to be wielded on others with others to make these changes happen. What other skills do you need to know um, to make the diagnosis work? Do you need to practice mm. to make sure your diagnosis yeah. translates into action? I would say a big one for me is being able to take all of this data and come up with the relevant, actionable insights. One of the examples that I use all the time to help people make the distinction is, you know, it's like, all right, data, for instance, is, is uh, um, knowing how many bananas are sitting on your counter. You know, um, you can have quantitative data, right? Like total number, um, weight of them. Yeah. You could have some descriptive information like smell, ripeness, uh, right? Like smell and spots and color can help you understand how ripe they are. That's information. So you've already, you know, done a little bit of sense making. And then, and th then the insight is like, what do I do with it? Okay. So let's say I have pretty ripe bananas. What do I do with it? And you need now some contextual awareness as well. And so you could say, great, like I have a, a puppy and I can mash a banana into their food and that's a way for it to get consumed. It's really nutritious or I'm going to turn it into some ice cream or I'm going to make a banana bread with it. Um, where most organizations stop is they'll say, I have four bananas. Okay, great. Awesome. You have four bananas. And then, so what? You know, and, and what that looks like is our feeding program fed 500 people this year. Okay. So what? What about what about these people? What what does it mean for the community? They they don't they don't draw the through line, right? And so and and that's why I'll go back to this the ways in which equity work has been happening in the last couple of years where organizations want to do some kind of assessment. They want to, you know, get other stakeholder points of view, but then the activities are almost always the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they haven't developed and some, some people could say like, this is data literacy. And I, I do think it is data literacy, but it's, it's also this like, this like deep sense of curiosity. And we have all the tools in the world to help us to, to get there. Yeah. You went through this process. You will learn a bunch of things about your organization. And so what are, what needs to happen specifically in your organization? Because I, I feel that deeply. And I think a theme that comes to mind immediately is when you're presenting those insights, right? Um, mm -hmm. You have data, you need to be able to pull them into insights. You talked about different situations where <laughs> the mental models of the organization, yeah. oh, you see where I'm going with this, are, are not even, they, they don't allow for a person to, they don't allow for insights that are outside of that mental model. Let me ask this question. I'd love to, for you to tell a story about what that might look like in practice. You've, you've collected the data, you have appropriate insights, you present it, and the folks are like, but I can't hear that one plus one is seven. I don't understand mm -hmm. what's going on. And in that situation, how, how do you present those? Do you try to present those insights to break someone's mental model? And, or what do you do? And if so, how do you do that? It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg. Um, I don't know that I, I don't know that I know what I've noticed, what I've observed is that you, this is where like, it's a little, um, Angela Duckworthy, like growth mindsets, fixed mindsets. A lot of people think I have growth mindsets because I watch a bunch of TED Talks and I read books. 
really the growth mindset is when I'm presented with something that doesn't align with my worldview, am I able, am I mm. able to take it in and shift my position and shift my position? You know, it's like no better, do better. And leaders, sometimes I think that when we're in, you know, trusting bonded relationships with our colleagues, whether it's a client relationship or you're, you know, you work inside of an organization, when I've noticed that when we have the bonded relationship and there's trust, you can sometimes move a person to make a different decision, to start to shift their point of view. Uh -huh. More often than not, I, I feel like I'm not convincing people, like I'm either coming to work inside of an organization um, where a person has growth mindsets. You know, this is the, this is the chicken and the egg. Like, can I, can I trigger the, the growth, the growth to happen with respect to mindsets or does it already exist? Mm -hmm. And then what I'm noticing is when I'm presenting information that might differ from how they see the world, they're able to take it and, and move a little bit differently. Right. So like, did I trigger it or did it exist? And I want to say that in most instances, it already existed. Mm. It already existed. And so if I brought information to them that was different than what they were expecting, they're able, they're able to keep going. Um, yes. They're we yeah. can't control anybody, right? People can only control themselves. We can only inspire things in others. I'd love to hear a story from you where you can talk about um, a, an experience where you are, um, you're expressing a insight uh, to someone about their work, about their organization, about their vision for the future that takes them in a different direction than they expected. And you, you have to use those those oft undiscussed, under-discussed skills to mm -hmm. either move them towards the change they say they wanted or accept, I've done my best, I've done my all, they're not going to change, time to take my work elsewhere. Well, I'm thinking about um, a client, Big Private Foundation, and they were earlier in their journey with, I would say earlier than, right? Um, but not by much. They they wanted to really think about how equity and inclusion was playing out in their portfolio. And, you know, we do some of the same, like same activities, right? Like fact finding, data finding, what's happening, getting the state of the state. And a couple of things came up, you know, so they're doing a lot of global grant making on the face of it. And when we looked at the data, they realized very quickly that almost 90% of their dollars were directly going specifically to white men in one of three high income countries. You can imagine US, Canada, UK, right? Maybe the Netherlands. And those folks were subcontracting to people on the ground in the global South for effectively pennies on the dollar to actually do the work. The other thing that came up was, hey, like all of the gatherings are happening at on days and times that are convenient for the funder. And there were people in the group who said, you know, well, the one nice thing about working virtually is that even if we have a meeting on Diwali, or Eid, or another, you know, holiday that's really important for us, at least I'm able to do a couple of hours of my meeting and still be with my family. And I'm not having to leave my family during what is effectively the equivalent of Christmas for an in-person meeting. Mm -hmm. And they took that information and they said, great. We are going to put together a calendar of hard no dates. And if Christmas is a hard no, then some of these other holidays and festivals are also hard no's. And we're going to put together a convening calendar that is respectful of 
our global network of experts. Mm -hmm. So they that, so that's one of the things they did. The second thing that they did was they said, all right, well, how can we build capacity to send money directly to the organizations that in some instances have been on the ground in, you know, Botswana or in Argentina or in Pakistan or India or wherever, right? They might've been partnering with the universities that are getting the money or the think tanks or the research institutions for a decade. How do we build their capacity to receive the funds directly? So, so they started to put some of their budget towards helping organizations figure out banking, operations, you know, all of these things uh -huh. that allow them to receive money from this institution directly. They also said, all right, so there are, and this is, you know, like, where does the resentment come from, from an earlier conversation? Well, I'm doing the work and I'm not getting the credit for it. And what it looks like, and you know this from having gotten your PhD in academia is that I'm doing the work, but somebody who ha who's, has a lot of distance from this work, my professor is, is, is the first author on a paper that gets accepted by nature. Mm -hmm. And my work is erased and my work is erased. And that is not about ego. That actually is about um, appropriation, right? Like you, you, you want to be able to say whose work this is. It matters. And so they, they did a lot of work with the people that they had been giving money to, and you know, asking for accountability on authorship credit, analysis credit, met methodology credit um, mm -hmm. for their partners in the global south. And I think after probably two years, they were able to shift 30% of their giving directly to organizations in the global South. Now, 30% isn't a lot, but when you think about hundreds of millions of dollars, that is a significant amount of money that's now going South of yes, the equator. More. And it means more, it matters more. I think about like, well, what was the catalyst? Right, like what was a catalyst? Why were they able to do it? And the reason that they were able to do it is because the person who was leading this body of work had spent a significant amount of their professional life living and working in the global south. Mm -hmm. They had connection and affinity to the needs and experiences of the people that were there and had a growth mindset that allowed them to receive this information and say, okay, yeah, I don't like it. I don't like the data and I'm going to do something differently about it. Now, there's a very similar situation that played out with a different leader in a different large private foundation that said, oh, yeah, I don't like the data. We're, we're going to keep giving our money to our trusted organizations. It's incumbent upon them to pull together a diverse team should they choose to, to deliver on this work, but we're not going to force them to do it because they've been our trusted partners for a really long time and they, and they get us, right? And it was really clear, not only that there were fixed mindsets, but there was also the, the ego and the really deep desire for comfort around, hey, I'm going to give money to who I can connect with easily. I'm going to give money to somebody that, that allows me to build social capital here and now, if I send that money to organizations led by people of color or to the global South, well, I'm not building capital with them. I'm not building the social capital with them in the same way as if I send that money to Stanford, to you know, University of North Carolina, to a white-led organization, to Candid. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> there are a lot of cushy powerful social change agents, right? People that hold power in these spaces and are like, no, you know what? We're going to be comfortable. We're going to stay comfortable because this is the way it's always been because it's the way it's always been. I ask you for your advice, friend. Uh, when you have a social change agent, somebody inside an organization, somebody who's an activist that's been exposed to the wrong side of how the sausage gets made, and they, they're they impassioned to make these changes, and they're trying to, they see the insights, they've collected uh, some amount of data, there might be more to collect, and they're trying to, um, they're trying to move forward with, all right, I see this change, I need people to recognize this change needs to be made. Uh, what, when they're on that journey, what principles should they adopt when trying to move forward? 
What's the persona? Um, let's talk about, for now, fundraisers, your patrons, mm. the people that are delivering you resources to be able to do your work. And in many situations, the people that are holding power over you because of those resources that they're offering. They might be a funder. They might be people that are connecting you to relationships. Those might be people that are putting you in particular rooms and putting you uh, into places to speak on your expertise and your capacity to leverage this change, this theory of change that you've built. When you're connecting with those patrons, um, even if they're not yet on your side, and yeah. you want to ask, you know, this is the change that needs to be made, and you want to uh, engage with them for the first time or for a long relationship, what advice do you have them about what they hold on that journey? Ooh, okay, so I would say two things, skill and strategy. Um, I think the skill, honestly, is vulnerability. The skill is vulnerability. You're a wealthy person that I'm in a professional relationship with, and I likely wish you were spending your money differently, mm. right? And I say your money, their money is actually, you know, if, like we, if we zoom out 30,000 foot, it's not their money. They have accumulated wealth. Okay. They've accumulated, they, they've, they've accumulated wealth by exploiting a class of workers that in many instances, they want to then turn around and support. So mm -hmm. I think the skill of vulnerability is being able to have the conversation and really get real with the person who has the resources and you want their resources. Yeah. Um, I think the skill is also ethics, right? Practicing, practicing ethics. And I've seen a lot of fundraisers do this. And I've seen a lot of organizations do this where they'll say, you know, our, like our values are no longer in alignment and I can't take your money right. or like, I would love your money, but the conditions with, with, with which it comes renders this gift Sense. It represents impotent. It renders it impotent, right? It has no value because it, the ways in which you want me to work, the reporting that you want me to do creates a burden that you're not going to realize the impact of your gift, right? Um, so that's the skill, right? Ethics, and I would say vulnerability. Um, we shouldn't be, and every, all of us have our own money stories. We should not be kowtowing and babysitting the feelings of people simply on the, simply on the basis of their wealth. And there's a white glove treatment that happens with people with wealth. And then we find ourselves in a scenario where the folks that are advising that are closest to, you know, philanthropists like Bill and Melinda Gates are giving them bad information to protect their feelings. Uh, $4 billion is a lot of money. And channeled in the right ways, it can have some really deep, profound impacts for real people in real communities, in real places. The strategy part of it is knowing what to say, when to say it, and knowing if you're not the right vehicle for the conversation. And do you need somebody who has greater affinity with the folks? And do you need to coach a colleague to have that conversation? What they say, what they say, facts don't care about your feelings. Something like that. Ah, yeah. Agreed. What is your gripe for equitable social change? I, I think, you know, one of my, my longstanding gripes is the lack of skills in the sector. Interesting. Say more. The lack of skills, right? Um, when I think about whether it's social impact work in a nonprofit or philanthropic context, a community foundation, or it's, you know, CSR and community engagement arms of organizations, I think like fundamentally people lack skills to understand the problem that they're trying to solve and the solution that is matched for the problem that they are trying to solve. So let's go back to this example of the theory of change, or there's a method called La Piana strategic planning, right? So a lot of organizations do this particular method and you can be trained in it and they're, they're going to do that. Or I'll, uh, I've seen over the course of the last 20 years, um, organizations, do, you know, spending time and money doing strengths lender or Myers-Briggs and paying for and doing these assessments, but they can't tell you why they do it. 
they don't actually know how to use the data. So if you have people with different kinds of personalities, what, draw the through line, what does that actually mean? What does that actually mean? Um, or the disk assessment, right? You know, So if you have an organization where 80% of your employees crave stability, what does that mean? And breaking down the insight into bite-sized actionable pieces. So if today it's 80%, then like almost like stock, you have to divest. Your entire portfolio can't be 80% of stock from one company. So you can't have a workforce where 80% of people crave stability and are doers and, you know, and so what do you do now? Maybe you figure out which of those 80% um, you can scale up to deal with ambiguity. Okay. And then you have to figure out over a longer time horizon, how you're going to hire Diff, like how are you, how are you going to hire differently and create succession plans so that you are bringing in people that can deal with, for instance, ambiguity, that you can bring in people that are problem solvers and doers and problem solvers in my mind are not the same persona. A doer is somebody who you give a list of tasks to and they can go off and do them, but they're not going to figure out necessarily how to solve a problem that they come across. And the doer is going to come to you and say, hey, Dr. Pierce, like, what do I do about this? How do I, how do you want me to solve it? They're not going to take the risk. They're not going to go figure it out. Right. So, so you need a variety of, of styles inside the organization. Like you actually, you need the doers, you, you need the doers, but you can't have 80%. And that's, that's my gripe is that we don't have, we don't have skills. We don't have the basic, 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 basic skills around strategy, around data literacy, around even how to gather information that's going to help us make decisions. <laughs>